Welcome to the world today. I'm Vakas Majid Khan. Today we are talking about uh, a very important uh, development. Uh, first of all, it's uh, the Pakistan-US relationship. Uh, today, Pakistan has finally received the official uh, communication from the US regarding the restrictions on Pakistani diplomats uh, traveling uh, within a 40 kilometer mile radius of their uh, posting. Uh, that is going to be discussed. And also there was a very interesting report in the Financial Times which stated that Pakistan is reducing its dependence on the U.S. arms. Uh, we'll be talking about that in detail, that it's not just the arms that we need to reduce our dependence on any other foreign country, but in fact, uh, how can we achieve complete independence from any foreign interference in Pakistan's affairs. Our second topic is uh, got to do with Mr. Modi, the Prime Minister of India, who is visiting the UK at the moment. Uh, how was he greeted in the UK and what statements he made there uh, will be our second topic of discussion. Now to get the conversation started, I'd like to introduce my guests in the studio. Joining me today for this discussion, first of all, we have Dr. Ghulam Mujadid and with him, Dr. Muhammad Khan, both are defense analysts. Thank you very much, sir, for being here. Sir, uh, first of all, uh, finally, there was a lot of uh, speculation in the media. There were reports uh, that the U.S. was taking these punitive measures against Pakistani diplomats uh, in a tit-for-tat sort of a response. Uh, how do you view this development, sir? The official notification has now been received by the Pakistani government regarding the movement of Pakistani diplomats in the U.S. Yes, uh, I think uh, uh, in, in some earlier program we discussed the, the dynamics of diplomatic relations between two countries. Diplomatic means a diplomatic core uh, in each other's capitals. And uh, the ba baseline was, the bottom line was that it depends uh, on a concept of reciprocity. Uh, the two nations are sovereign as far as their being nation states are concerned. And their diplomat therefore enjoy the same rights um, in, in both the capitals. However, um, if uh, some country feels that its diplomats are being unduly you know, pressured or something, then it can, imp on the reciprocal <laughs> basis, if the assumption is true that you know, the, the host country is not treating as per the, the protocols that are there in the international community, then it can then reciprocate in same kind or manner. However, the, the level of intensity might differ or something, so it sets in a chain of tit-for-tat uh, reactions. Uh, in ideal and adjusted relationship between two countries, this situation should not arise. And if it has arisen, then we should go back to the normal uh, you know, uh, diplomatic, pr uh, healthy diplomatic uh, practices uh, between the two countries. America remains important for Pakistan, as indeed Pakistan is important for China. And the, in, the, in the whole globe, the international community has to move freely so that it can do the function that it has to. Undue restrictions, uh, they, 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 they are a bad taste, and they hinder the, the free working of the diplomatic core in any country. So I hope that, uh, that, that this America would, uh, will not go too far uh, in, in, in the restrictions because it should understand that as a sovereign nation, Pakistan also has the right to exercise reciprocity, but we want, you know, good balanced relationship with the United States of America and with the community at, of the world at large. Having said that, uh, Dr. Khan, in your opinion, uh, when we compare the, the environment uh, the, of the U.S. and the environment of Pakistan, it's a completely different world. Uh, American diplomats are given tri travel advisories by the, their own U.S. State Department. Even the embassy issues travel warnings to them, and it is out of security fears that the uh, movements of diplomats are curtailed or are protected in Pakistan because of security. Now, here we have a case which is uh, completely the opposite. It is not keep, uh, taking in cognizance the, the facts on the ground and reacting uh, in merely uh, out of uh, spite, I would say, rather than any uh, rational uh, basis. What's your opinion, sir? Thank you, Vakas. Yes, I agree with you that uh, in Pakistan we are very careful uh, because uh, in the last one decade or more than that, there have been a um, law and order situation, security situation, and particularly for the U.S. nationals, things were not uh, very, very, uh, I would say, that attractive that they could be allowed to move freely anywhere in the Pakistan. But despite that, I know the defense and the military attaches of the United States of America and the other country, they were made to visit any part of the Pakistan they have been visiting many a time uh, 
uh, once I was part of this formation, um, uh, this organization, I have been conducting ourselves. They were moving freely anywhere in Pakistan. But yes, we are concerned about their security because while they are in, here in the Pakistan, uh, we are responsible for their security and all that. What Pakistan took the mayor, uh, those were purely on the security grounds for their safety and protection. But whatever United States of America is doing, that is indeed, I would say that uh, this is, um, uh, these are the excesses. And these excesses are, I think, uh, it is in a way uh, not uh, good uh, precedence for diplomatic relationships between Pakistan and United States of America. Because we have, uh, in our history, many ups and downs. Because this um, uh, relationship, uh, as per uh, former Pakistani President General uh, Ziaulak, that uh, between two unequals. But we try to maintain uh, the dignity, respect uh, for entire diplomatic core of the Pakistan uh, here in the Pakistan. But many a time, uh, some of the countries, and this time United States of America, they are trying to restrain or constrain the movement of the Pakistani diplomat within a radius of 45 kilometers or so. This is indeed unjustified. Unjustified in a way that we have different environment and they have different environment. There is no security situation in the United States of America. Nor Pakistani diplomats or the diplomatic staff, uh, they are carrying out any sort of a spying uh, within the United States of America. Yes, those can be uh, those can be applicable right here in the Pakistan, but we are otherwise we have never bothered them. Then you know that the immediate cause or the effect was because of the colonel uh, who uh, indeed violated uh, who did two things. One, he violated the traffic signal that is a rule, and that has to be uh, respected. And number two, he caused death of a, a young man, and uh, then uh, I think in the garb of diplomatic immunity and all that. There were many excuses made that uh, he should be given that sort of relaxation and all that. Pakistan was not very, very, I would say, rigid on that aspect. Uh, even we had uh, in our history people like Raymond Davis and all that, those who were never authorized diplomatic immunity, but even we managed for them. I think United States of America should have respected uh, the relation, its relationship with the Pakistan just on mere assumptions or many other excuses, maybe the Afghanistan or our neighbor, eastern neighbor, India. Perhaps that is not the right uh, precedence uh, President Trump is going to set in the bilateral relationship of Pakistan and the United States. Definitely, we have the bad patches in our history, but those bad patches even uh, were uh, where we manage the relationship, both sides. Even today, once the United States of America is totally focused toward India on many aspects, maybe it is the economic reason the strategic reason. But uh, definitely Pakistan is a country which has supported the US-led operations in the entire these from 2001 till 2018. And we are still doing that. And uh, US and NATO must remember that uh, while they were drawing down from Afghanistan, bulk of their forces, it was under the coverage of the Pakistani army, the Pakistani armed forces. Otherwise, it would not have been possible for them because it would have been a pitched battle for them because they were not uh, having uh, very, they were not enjoying a very good uh, relationship in Afghanistan, particularly the Taliban, they were after them and all that. Now, uh, once it has been done and the United States has imposed this restriction on the Pakistan diplomat, I think um, as per uh, Pakistan embassy in the United States of America, I was uh, listening to him yesterday, other day before yesterday. He was telling that the, yes, our relationship, we are passing through a very, very difficult time in our relationship. But uh, he hoped that this relationship is going to be restored and the misperception or the misunderstanding between these two countries are going to be removed soon. But US must remember that uh, only uh, all these responsibilities on some of the acquisition United States has been making cannot be put on the Pakistan because pa Pakistan after all has been making sure that uh, it do not host um, any sort of the terrorist, it do not host any sort of the militants on its side of the border. And the evidence we have in the form of that we are erecting uh, entire uh, park of one border with a fence, a barbed wire, concentina wire completely. That means that Pakistan is absolutely clear on this ground and Pakistan want a peace. Pakistan want that neither the terrorists should move from Afghanistan to Pakistan nor from Pakistan to Afghanistan. That would uh, in, indeed uh, close the door for this uh, militancy or the acquisitions on each other. And uh, United States just mere on the suspension, uh, suspicion, or I would say that uh, on uh, false uh, information, or just I would say the stereotype information should not do this. 
should behave maturely because United States is a superpower. Yes, it's very strange when we look yes. at the behavior that is being meted out towards Pakistan. Let's move on to the uh, Financial Times report, sir, because it's uh, far more interesting. Uh, one of the things that it begins to say is that uh, the shift that is taking place uh, between Pakistan's uh, relationship with the U.S. and other countries in the region, uh, it, it will have geopolitical repercussions. Uh, what geopolitical repercussions can there be for the United States in uh, this latest uh, behavior that it's betting out to Pakistan. It's going to be for America's detriment, obviously, but uh, how can you elucidate what those uh, uh, issues might be? Yeah, uh, you see, United States of America needs, like any other major or superpower, friends and allies at, um, in the globe, in every region. Uh, because no matter how a super uh, superpower is, uh, it cannot do everything at its own. It needs to have allies. NATO is an example. United States of America still needs its European allies to do whatever it wants to do, especially in the Mediterranean uh, area as well as in uh, other parts of the globe, like in Afghanistan it did. As far as South Asian region is concerned, the region is important because it is situated very close to the Asia. It is part of the Asia Pacific, where the whole of the strategic and financial uh, power of the world is concentrating and is going to concentrate. Earlier on, before uh, especially the end of the Cold War, it was the Euro-Atlantic uh, region where most of the power of the globe concentrated. Now the shift is taking place towards Asia and Asia Pacific, where South Asia is a very important area. Therefore, both India and Pakistan are uh, very, very special for Americans' um, point of view in this area, from the alliance point of view, as indeed from uh, you know opposite point of view, if there is some uh, you know, deterioration of the relations, uh, for example, with Pakistan. So America needs to continue, continuously adjust the relations with the countries, uh, and Pakistan is a very important country. So, and if it uh, does, if it is not very careful, then it is possible that the region wholly, uh, you know, tilts itself to towards the uh, opposing, so to say, in the geopolitics, opposing pole of the power that is the emerging Chinese power. So, well, there are alignments uh, with China, there are alignments with the United States of America, but if you, you know, uh, overly deteriorate your relations with one particular country, the geopolitical shifts, as you asked, they are bound to take place. So what America needs to be, you know, care about is that it, the, the shifts do not overly, you know, turn against its interest in the region. I mean, Pakistan needs to be given due importance and due respect. Well, it can have any amount of relationship with India, but the dynamics of... Not India, at the cost of Pakistan. Not the dynamics of Indo-Pakistan relation has to be kept in mind. Otherwise, it will be too lopsided and it will ultimately be deteriorating, I mean, detrimental to, to, to anybody's interest here. Dr. Khan, uh, when we look at this uh, new uh, shift of uh, preferences or uh, relationship uh, between Pakistan and America, the, the report says that it's not new. It started uh, during the last months of the Obama administration. Uh, that's when Congress blocked the sale of F-16 aircraft to Pakistan. Uh, that then re uh, reinforced uh, the understanding in, in Pakistani uh, uh, diaspora that uh, the United States could no longer be relied on as their armed forces' primary source of advanced weapons mm -hmm. now. Yeah. That's very clear. So, if you'd like to comment yes, on because, this aspect, uh, very nice indeed. Yes, um, uh, I remember that it was seven hundred forty million dollars were to be paid by United States of America. Indeed, it was as a relaxation. It was not the total total payment from the United States of America for the F-16, uh, but they stopped it. And uh, you know that immediate cause become it was Indian pressure indeed on the United States of America, because I remember that it was two thousand sixteen, and uh, Narendra Modi went to United States of America. He was given a red carpet reception and all that. He addressed the United States um, um, uh, Parliament, indeed, very eloquently and talked about uh, strategic stability in this particular uh, part of the world with the China and so many aspects that is correlation and the uh, aspects where the United States and India, they could cooperate 
at strategic level, at economic level, and the political level. And definitely, once Obama administration or the US administration, indeed, they have a consistency of the policy. They were looking at its relationship with the, uh, India. Uh, they uh, relegated Pakistan on many aspects, and this was one of the aspects. But in the process, I think, uh, a very good thing was done. And uh, since I know this aspect that uh, Pakistan Army, Pakistan Navy, and Pakistan Air Force, they are not less dependent on United States weapons. Uh, gone are the days once we used to be wholly solely dependent on the Western uh, military equipment and all that. But today, uh, all these three services, they have their indigenous production of the weapon. For example, in case of the Air Force, we have JF-17 Thunder. And this aircraft is light in weight, but uh, having the more maneuverable, uh, maneuverability is more than what the F-16 is. Definitely F-16 has its own qualities, and uh, I think uh, Commodore Mc um, Jad, Dr. Mujad knows better. But I think uh, as far as the war worthiness or the combat uh, ability is concerned, that in no way it is less than that. Then in case of Pakistan, the main battle tank, you know, Pakistan Army, the main battle tank, Al Khalid, it is a production of Pakistan now. So initially we started with the giant venture of Pakistan and China, but holy story, you know, it is a Pakistani production. And it is considered to be the best main battle tank. And so we are uh, manufacturing uh, um, APCs, small arms and all that. Even today we are uh, exporting the weapon to many of the countries in the Middle East, in Africa, and I would say even Southeast Asian countries. Then uh, as far as the Pakistan Navy is concerned, yes, we have the frigates. Initially we purchased from uh, uh, China, some of the uh, ships from uh, France. But today all manufacturing is being done in Karachi shipyard. Therefore, we are not dependent. And the response you have seen since last few months, or I would say over a year, now that Pakistan has given a cool uh, response to what the US has been putting sanctions or stopping the coalition support fund even, or many others, uh, for example, stopping the funds or uh, some cooperative mechanism. And Pakistan did not uh, behave in haste or did not go for asking them that, okay, let's reestablish the relationship or res uh, start resupply and all that. That was indeed something new for the uh, Trump administration, for the Pentagon, for the State Department, and I would say for the White House and all that. They never expected that uh, they will have a Pakistan like that. Since Pakistan already had a st strategic stability in the form of nuclear weapon, and uh, that nuclear weapon, uh, I'm not aware about the quantity, but about the quality, definitely it is said that they are of the best quality. Therefore, that element of deterrence is there. No United States of America perhaps would be wishing because they want that uh, they should keep Pakistan at a distance, but at the same time, there should not be a disconnection. So in a way, they want to make use of the Pakistani, uh, some of the potentials, Pakistan geopolitics and all that, but at the same time, not benefiting. They are not in a mood to benefit Pakistan the way it used to be, because for the moment, I think there is no major campaign going on, except uh, the war against terrorism. Pakistan otherwise is fighting reason being that we are the one who suffered most. And that's what we are advising um, our neighbor, Afghanistan, that uh, you need to bring stability in your own country. Because this stability may not be the target of some of the countries, those who are uh, having their military bases in your uh, country, or those who are uh, living in your country um, in the form of, um, I would say, that uh, reconstruction and rehabilitation. Therefore, you need to make use of uh, uh, your own, I think, uh, uh, head, your own vision, your own foresight, because after all, uh, the president of Afghanistan, the chief executive of Afghanistan, they have to be answerable in front of the people of Afghanistan at the end of their tenure. Therefore, they should uh, demonstrate something. As far as Pakistan is concerned, that uh, um, there has been a very, very uh, stable, very, very measured and the calculated response from the Pakistan ever since uh, August 21st, 2017, once uh, South Asian policy was announced by President Trump. Thereafter, there have been many occasions once harsh, I would say, that uh, language was used against Pakistan, but Pakistan refused to surrender in front of any, which means that uh, Pakistani leadership uh, has a strong body language, a stable and consistent body language, and that indeed at time irritates these people because we are not ready to submit. That is something, the one aspect. I think the most important thing that we can take away from what you just said, sir, is about uh, uh, the ban that America imposed on Pakistan it accelerated Pakistan's efforts to uh, shift its military procurement away from the U.S. Uh, made weapons towards Chinese one. And more than that, sir, it was the indigenous and domestically developed 
uh, industry, for Pakistan's yes. reliance or self-reliance uh, improved dramatically. So in a way, it was a blessing in disguise, and it always is a blessing in disguise whenever uh, America has withdrawn support from Pakistan. Would you agree with this statement, sir? Uh, more than that, I think I would agree um, I mean, 100% or even more than that. Uh, you see, uh, in 1965 uh, was the first time that America imposed uh, sanctions on Pakistan. That's right, sir. Supplying Absolutely. military aid to Pakistan. And then in the early 90s, you know, there was this famous Pressler Amendment and again, the sanctions were imposed on Pakistan. I just want to, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt yes. you, I want to add these figures, sir, because sure. it's important for us to, uh, you know, get this figure in. Uh, U.S. weapons exports to Pakistan have plummeted uh, from $1 billion to just $21 million last year. And uh, during the same period, uh, imports from China have also uh, dr dramatically reduced from $747 million to $514 million. So it, that shows us that Pakistan is now becoming far more self-reliant mm. and not dependent on outside help for its own security, sir. That's absolutely true. So this second figure that you gave, the Chinese uh, uh, military transaction with Pakistan, uh, 21 million with United States and 514 million with, United, uh, with, China, with, with China. And it is just the last year. It is snapshot of the last year. Yes, sir. Okay, but since 1965, Pakistan's re military relationship with China have, you know, always uh, seen an upstream uh, and they, they, they have yet to, of course, zenith, but uh, they are constantly going. That graph that is, that is there in the uh, Financial Times report, uh, example, uh, you know, uh, it gives a very clear uh, picture. indication picture. Yes, and it shows both it overlapping China and United States of America military dealing with Pakistan, whereas the American military dealing has seen very, 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 you know, uh, sharp uh, troughs and uh, highs and downs. The, the Chinese one since 1965 is, you know, go and now uh, the, the difference is very, very large between the Ch uh, United States military relations with Pakistan and with w w what Chinese relations are. Now, why they are blessings? Because since that time, you know, starting from a, a complete indigenous cap attainment of nuclear capability to the di diversification and indigenization of the military capability by Pakistan is because uh, you know a lot large factor has to go uh, on on to the it has to be attributed to uh, Americans sanctions. Uh, sanctions and all that and we wish that these sanctions continue so that we the process uh, the path that we have followed it you know goes even further and it is just good because we have to indigenize we have to depend on our on our own, own selves and the good news is that uh, you know uh, uh, apart from uh, middle uh, class technology weapons to high end uh, you know systems like gf 17s and missiles on which our you know defense or nuclear deterrence so largely depends is all indigenous uh, to pakistan but that 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 just a word of caution that does not mean that like any other country Pakistan does, uh, should not diversify its every front and means. Absolutely, it, sir. My next question to you was, was going to be that it is wonderful and great news that we've heard that Pakistan is now uh, getting f f uh, more and more uh, <coughs> self-reliant when it comes to its own security. But we'd like to see that now extend into other spheres as well. We don't want, we want uh, independence economically. We don't want to be begging at the IMF's door or the World Bank. We want to have the same kind of uh, self-reliance when, when we talk about Pakistan's diplomatic relations, when we talk about our economic uh, product productivity or development. So all these aspects, sir, how, how, how long or how soon do you think we'll be able to get there where we are financially, diplomatically, economically independent from influence? Yes, um, I tell you what. You know, uh, some, some uh, the responsibility has to be shared by Pakistanis. Uh, we are inefficient as far as our economic infrastructure or production is concerned. And for no reason. We have great potentials, but we are very slow to realize those potentials. So number one, what we, we need to do is to, in order to, we have to reinvigorate our internal economic production system. Mm -hmm. We have technology, we have the know-how, we have the educated people, and we can collaborate with other countries in this regard who are willing to do that. So we must, only then, once we have a strong base within, our reliance from abroad would, would, would come down. And they say, the social scientists say, 
that why is so heavy reliance uh, of outside sources? Uh, because they come easily and what we have to do, we don't do anything and we relax. So in case we have to stop that, it is good that you know by some other mechanisms probably the, the you know a, there is a reluctance in the international community to aid Pakistan. It is a great blessing also, and I wish and pray that it reinvigorates our internal potential. That's very important, uh, Doctor. Would you like to comment? Yes, on this? yes, I would definitely. <coughs> uh, apart from what Doctor Mujahid said, I say I, I mean that. Uh, uh, because uh, Pakistan uh, has been bestowed with uh, all sort of uh, raw material, minerals, um, and uh, now, as I learned, that oil and gas resources have been discovered almost in all parts of the country. And then you have uh, an economy, economic base, which is agrarian uh, oriented. I mean, it is based on agriculture. More than that, sir, it's based on water, and, and we uh, are really crucially stuck up when uh, it comes to water. Up. But despite that, let me share with you that 2008 to 2011, this was a crisis, international crisis. And during this international crisis, the capitalist countries, they were the demonstration against the capitalism in all the capitalist countries. But Pakistan was the only country along with, I would say that few countries other, that it was neither affected, nor we felt indeed that depression or that crisis at the global level, number one. Which means that our agrarian base is still very strong and we can meet the basic requirements, what a human being or a society need we are fulfilling that, number one. But having said that, that is not sufficient because you need diversification. You need to be in line with the international community as far as the economic needs are concerned, or economic base are concerned. Here what we were asked, what we <coughs> need to do, that our economic policies unfortunately have not been based uh, on uh, sound grounds, on uh, I would say that well calculated grounds. We need economic managers. Whereas at the top level, we need to have uh, good governance because that unfortunately over the years has been a problem in the Pakistan. That it, was, it has been a constant problem in the Pakistan. And in every sphere, sir. That unfortunately. But apart from that, once we have the good governance at the top, perhaps the travel down should be good economic managers. That should be, I would say, at the grassroots level, at the mid-career level and all that. And indeed, we have in the academic uh, circle, we have the people, those who know the economy and how to improve. And then establishment of uh, industries, as a matter of fact. Today, if we look at the India, they were nowhere uh, before 1990. It was after 1992, Shining India slogan started, and then they started moving upward. Uh, their currency, indeed, Because was their basic uh, policies that they had followed in the beginning of their country yes. were the correct ones. That's nice. So what we need to do, that uh, we first um, put right our economic policies. We need to uh, correctly assess the requirements of the country and the potential which is available in the country. Then through managerial staff, economic managerial staff, I think we can manage all these things. But dependence again should here be on the resources we have at the level of the country and we have abundance, we have abundance. And then Vakas, I would not say that um, uh, anybody that uh, he or uh, any ruler has not done uh, his best, but uh, I think uh, there was a requirement that uh, more calculations, more I would say that uh, homework should have been done on the economic basis and Pakistan has the potential. Even if it is done today, despite that so many uh, aspects, opportunities losses, have been lost. I think uh, we still have uh, GDP which is 4.5 or around 5, I would say 4.7 or 4.8. That's uh, good enough, but uh, seeing the potential, I think we can improve and we can make use of the resources within Pakistan in order to better the economy of the Pakistan as if the military, all three forces, they invested they indeed make investment and made good military uh, industrial projects. Why not the other side? I think they can do a lot and together uh, we can make uh, economic system which is sound and this economic system should move from one phase to another, I mean five year to five year, taking into consideration the requirement of the population, the youth and all that. This would uh, uh, take care of two aspects. One, that you have the potential youth which is 60 to 65 percent, those who can indeed incorporate it given a job and all that, and then output would be accordingly. I would, there would be a proportionate out, uh, output. Rather, these people, they are at the mercy of, at time, the evil forces and creating line order situation. They can be utilized, and their utilization can be in the correct form. Thus, it is going to be the double benefit. Well, let's hope that that happens, sir. That's a big hope. Uh, one final point, sir. Uh, what we've also talked about this earlier, but uh, Donald Trump, uh, when he came into power, uh, he suspended $2 billion of military aid to Pakistan. 
Uh, that obviously has uh, further exacerbated the Pakistan-US relationship. Uh, the thought is also that this kind of behavior or policy being uh, pursued by the US against Pakistan has further pushed Pakistan into uh, towards Beijing's camp. Now, that is another dynamic that is unfolding to the detriment of America. So this particular policy that the US is now following of uh, pressurizing Pakistan through different means, is it working, sir? Is it paying the dividends that they hoped that it would, or is it having the opposite effect? Yes, uh, I mean, opposite effects to the intentions of United States of America. You know, that, is, that is what we are talking. Of course, if you uh, am uh, estrange Pakistan to an extent where it no, no longer has any expectation or hope from the United States of America, then I just refer to my earlier opening uh, explanation that no matter how super is United States of America, it needs to have friends and adjustable you know, relationship uh, with, with every country. And Pakistan, as I told you before, is a very, very important country. It can just not be left alone. Okay. So in that sense, it will definitely have negative repercussions for United States of America's you know, national interest if it estranges Pakistan to a very large extent. Okay, and for Pakistan, which is what we are seeing right now, uh, we are which witnessing is, which that is what because this, uh, uh, you know, these curbs on Pakistani diplomats exactly. are, are part of the chain. Exactly, and if you uh, put restrictions on military capability of Pakistan in any way, for example, you know, we we have certain uh, American systems. If you stop their uh, su su supply of the spares or something, then uh, it it is a foregone conclusion that if there is even a slightest dent. It is a dent against, uh, God forbid, Pakistan's capability against fighting terrorism, which we are fighting on behalf of the world. So I think, um, I, and if uh, America has a choice to do that, but if it does that, you would yourself realize that how counterproductive this kind of a behavior would be for American interests themselves right. in the area. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, let's move on to our second topic, sir, which is also quite important, <coughs> and that is uh, Mr. Uh, Narendra Modi visiting the United Kingdom. Mm. Uh, he was met uh, by a very large number of protesters. Uh, they greeted Mr. Uh, Modi with placards which said that Modi go home. Uh, we stand uh, against Modi and against the agenda of hate. Mm. And they were talking about how um, BJP or under Modi has turned uh, India into a Hindu fascist state. That is the perception that Indians, mm. uh, people, uh, expats from India, were protesting against Mr. Modi uh, in London. It, that's such a huge message that is mm. going out to the world. Uh, do you think that the world is uh, is waking up and, and listening to that message that the people of India are giving about the kind of government that is uh, in, in place in India right now, sir? Or do you think it's just a mere uh, just dramatics and nothing more? No, these are not dramatics. Uh, they are uh, the reflections of reality. But then at the uh, other side, they are not the complete reality then by themselves. We must not judge uh, a country just because the inmates of that country or you know, expatriates demonstrated against the head of the state visiting, because these things keep happening. But they are part of a very, very grave reality, which a country or... In but they're in a very case, important uh, uh, symptom that speaks quite loudly to the rest of the world when then injustice is taking place or people are raising their voice against injustice, which is now rampantly spreading across the India. Yeah, that means that there are internal dynamics within India that show themselves uh, in, in <coughs> these kind of international protests against some domestic policy measures that Indian government is taking. That is a fact. Absolutely. But that's a fact. But then what I'm trying to say is that we sh I mean, uh, si si since we are here to analyze things and, you know, everything has points, uh, you know, or, pros, or sides, and cons. pros and cons and things. Yes, I, I'm afraid that we should, if we just uh, conclude it by, the, well, there is a demonstration, so India is failing uh, at home. Uh, India has grave challenges. It's a, it's a very big population. It has grave challenges. And the political consciousness within Indian masses is, uh, is, is a lot. It is galore. And it is reflection of the same outside India also. 
No, you tell me. That India is, well, uh, we see it as an enemy polity. But if you see it as a social scientist, and with that kind of political awareness within the Indian populace, that Absolutely. they can stand for their rights Absolutely. and all that, right. I think this is a very positive sign. And uh, remember, they're also human beings. And uh, as I said earlier many times, that Pakistan is, you know, is for its people. And so is every other country created for its people. And if the, the people, they, they feel wronged, they come on the domestic streets as well as on the international streets. So that whatever is the rectification that can be done, that must be sought to be done. So in, this is, indeed. I think, that kind of pressure. And within India, about a month mad, they had just, uh, you know, stopped uh, India for, 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 for a few weeks. I mean, the trains and the communications and everything, there was one, or that means that there was a closure a lockdown. of a lockdown yeah. Yeah. On, on, on the same grounds because the, the minorities felt that the laws that protected them, they were being diluted somehow, and so they came on the street. And, and that is what was happening. And, and we are seeing that, that India is moving towards this fascist Hindu sort of a behavior uh, against minorities living in India, and obviously they are going to make a hue and cry about it. Sir, what are the statements that came out from somebody who was protesting uh, in England? The Indian government, they say, is doing nothing. Uh, and you feel sorry for the families because of the total injustice of it all. This is Navindra Singh, uh, Indian-born lawyer who lives in Britain. This is what he had to say. He further said that uh, Mr. Modi has the power, has had the power for four years now, and there has been no policy change to help protect women and children. And of course, this we've seen in the, in the backdrop of the incident that took place in Kashmir, where a yes. child of eight years was yes. mercilessly raped and murdered inside a Hindu temple. Uh, and that also under the protection of a policeman. So what, what can we well, say because, about that? Uh, this time uh, there has been, a, I would say, development. And this development has not been seen since last, I would say, almost four years now that uh, Narendra Modi is in power. He came into power in May uh, 2014. And thereafter, um, yes, there have been at time Kashmiris, they were uh, raising their slogan for their right once Modi was there in the New York, London or anywhere. But this massive demonstration at uh, uh, UK particularly, it wasn't seen earlier. Once Modi was there, it was Commonwealth uh, meeting and all that. I'm sorry to interrupt you, sir, but it's also happening within India. No, no, I'm, t I'm just a coming over And we have that. the BJP lawmaker I am, I am coming who is that. also accused of uh, That's nice. raping a I'm teenager. I'm coming over to that. I will cover this entire episode. Please, sir. Indeed, what happened that uh, that eight-year child, Asifa, uh, the way she was raped, the way she was then murdered, indeed, uh, that is uh, perhaps it's uh, one, uh, I would say that any man, any any human being uh, would, I would say, it is very difficult for him or her to describe that entire story. And sir, let me please add here that uh, the entire Muslim population of that village has now run away from that village. Yes. There are no Muslims in that village anymore. They are f afraid of their, that's their lives. That's a strategy. I, I, uh, that's a strategy. Indeed, they were the Bakarwals. They were the people. There's the nomads, indeed. And uh, nomads, they have the uh, six months at one place and six months at another place. And this was their permanent place because um, at the end of the uh, winter season, then they moved to another place. What happened that uh, these type of incidents, they are happening in the Indian occupied Kashmir very frequently. I have an estimate, 11,000 women from the age of 8 years to age of 80 years, they have been raped so far and this is on record, this is recorded. You must have been seen, uh, you must have seen that uh, human, human rights, uh, he was the head of the commission, he wept. There were the tears in his eyes once he was describing the Indian human rights violation in the Indian occupied Kashmir. It is just a few, few days back. About this girl, indeed, it has shaken the entire India. But India is today known as a rapist country. And you know that the lady liar who took the responsibility to plead the case of this girl, she was also, you know, that uh, I heard that uh, she was also raped. But at least I know that she has been threatened yes. on uh, many occasions and all that, that you should not uh, pursue this case and all that. But this has created a sort of, I would say, that uh, deviant in the Indian society. This is something, um, a new thing, that uh, Narendra Modi and his BJP, they were presenting Indian society as a very strong society, united society. But now, as far as uh, minorities are concerned, which includes around more than 15% Muslims, then the Christians, then the Sikhs. And you have seen in the, at London also, that six, they were alongside the Kashmiris. Absolutely. And so. some of the Hindus were also there, those who had the conscience indeed, they were there, which means that within India, 
but society is divided. Why society is divided? Because it was it started uh, the division started when uh, Yogi took over as the chief minister of uh, UP. UP, and immediately after taking over the power, he said three things. He said that uh, uh, the Muslim mosque should have the idol. I mean, uh, please keep uh, these uh, Hindu idols in the Muslims mosque. Then uh, rape the Muslim, even bring them out from the Muslim women, even bring them out from the graves. And third, that anybody um, having, uh, I mean, that uh, uh, eating the uh, flesh, of, flesh the of the cow, particularly, is going to be uh, given the uh, death penalty and all that. So these things were indeed very, very disturbing. And the language he was using against the minorities, that garbapsi, uh, as a matter of fact, that your forefather, they were converted to Muslims or the Christian for that matter. Now it is time that you come back to Hinduism. Otherwise, uh, you will be forced or you will be asked to leave India. This is a strategy which is being uh, followed and this has the backing of Narendra Modi. Reason being, that Narendra Modi himself is a member of the RSS. RSS alongside, you know that RSS, this is the only party that its militant wing came, being, uh, came into being first in 1923 to 1925 and thereafter the uh, political wing came after once India was decolonized in 19... So don't you think that uh, India's Western partners uh, are observing these uh, events unfolding in India? What do you think their reactions and their uh, feelings would be when they see these events? And uh, we don't see the appropriate response coming from uh, the uh, upholders of human rights. Well, and actually, what yes, uh, yes. Human rights organization, the academic circle, and the civil society of international community. They have a different perception about the India, but uh, the governments in the Western circle, particularly United States of America and uh, the European, since they have interest with the India, economic interest and strategic interest. Therefore, their perception about India is very clear that India is a, a country which has a massive human rights violation in its credit. And India is a country where the, um, where the minorities are being isolated, they are being um, exploited and all that. But since they have their strategic and economic interests, therefore they are not opposing the India um, outrightly. But as far as the civil societies, academic circle and the human rights organization are concerned, they have a very, very different perception about the India. And this indeed, this incident and such like incident in other parts of the India, those are indeed uh, the confirmation with the international community. That's why you have seen that even the uh, people from the Europe, they were part of these demonstrations and they were raising uh, vices against the Indian Prime Minister, they were raising vices against the India. The sort of the Indian secularism, what they are projecting at the international le level and what as a matter of fact they have at the domestic level. So this is indeed, yes, that international community is watching all these developments with carefully, a lot of care and perhaps time is not uh, far, I think, that Indian uh, this covert uh, activities or whatever the appreciation it had in the past that's going to be exposed badly and India is going to indeed be um, uh, exploited. So let's uh, not, also, not exposed. because we are almost out of time, but I felt that this is important to share that Mr. Modi, while speaking at this uh, forum which was organized to, for him to address the diaspora in London, uh, it was called Bharat Ki Baat Sab Ke Saath in which he claimed uh, that the surgical strikes that were made, so-called so, so surgical strikes that were made uh, by India, India had repeatedly attempted to contact Pakistan's government to inform them about the operation. How absurd is this particular statement? And I quote, I said, before India gets to know, we should call Pakistan and tell them that we did so they can come and collect the dead bodies if they have time. We are calling them since 11 a.m., but they are, they are too scared to answer the phone. And at 12, we spoke to them and then told them, and then told the Indian media. Is that the most absurd statement coming from a head of state that you've ever heard, or what, sir? It makes no sense. Well, uh, we don't have much more time to go into the Because very briefly, yes, since sir, you please. have asked this question, indeed, immediately after the Indian claim of surgical strikes and all that, which never happened indeed, and uh, I have the ground uh, facts available with me, I have operated in all these areas that there were no surgical strikes. There were no Indian can never dare to cross the line of control. No, no but the it. thing is, sir, but he was saying he was claiming that he was going to inform Pakistan that they were going to make these strikes, or they were going to inform Pakistan that they already made these strikes. Wouldn't Pakistan already know if somebody crossed the border from India into Pakistan? Are Pakistani armed forces are very, very vigilant. Surveillance system is very, very. So effective. it's just the absurdity of the statement, sir. In, indeed, I think he has been. Forum. He has been indeed on this account. He has been even uh, ashamed at the domestic level also by even the Congress uh, party. 
and many of the leaders which were of the of course I, they were the part of the uh, bjp they were all right so thank you very much thank sir for taking out the time you. and uh, sharing your views with ptv world well uh, as we always urge you please draw your own conclusions from what you've heard but uh, Coming close to home, uh, we also have some problems that we need to sort out. And uh, uh, today's problem is that of Bashir Baloch, who is a singer. And uh, those countries that are, do not respect and care for their own artists are doomed in the long run. And we must uh, get up and take notice of what the state of our country's artists is like. He said, take away my medals and take away my awards. Just give me bread. Now, that is a very, very strong statement coming from a, a very well-established and recognized, respected artist in Pakistan. So I think the government really needs to wake up on this uh, fact and uh, do something for the artists of Pakistan. We, in fact, do need to have an entire show on this subject, and we will be talking about it in our coming programs. Thank you very much for watching World Today. On that note, it's goodbye.